and he's assistant professor in King's Road, uh, Ben Abdelaziz University. Uh, Dr. Hijazi uh, graduated from a school of medicine uh, in Jordan 1982, and he has Jordanian Board of Pediatrics in 1986, uh, then American Board of Pediatrics in 1993, as well American Board of Pediatrics and Critical Care Medicine in 1996. Uh, as well, we have uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, Qobbani moderating uh, also uh, with us uh, tonight. He's a consultant, pediatric cardiac ICU and Ministry of National Guard Health Affairs, and associate professor in King Saud bin Abdelaziz uh, University for Health Sciences. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mohammed has his uh, medical school in Syria in 1987, the American Board of Pediatrics in 1992, uh, then Fellowship of Pediatric Critical Care uh, Medicine in University of Florida in 1997, as well American uh, Board of uh, Pediatric Critical uh, Care in 1998. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mohammed, uh, Mike, with you, you are welcome to introduce uh, our meeting tonight. <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum to everybody. Uh, just uh, uh, so short, uh, short introduction about the session. Um, the main, the main uh, subject of the session is basically talking about the ultrasound and uh, the focus of ultrasounds in uh, hemodynamic and respiratory assessment in uh, uh, cardiac patient. Um, we have. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all the colleagues who are going to participate as speaker in this uh, session. I would like to thank uh, the organizer uh, of this session, and in particular, Dr. Ayel Harbi, Dr. Samih Ismail, who did all the effort in organizing and uh, uh, working in the background uh, to have this meeting. Um, it's a pleasure to have my colleagues, inshallah, who is going to join me. Uh, uh, our head, Dr. Omar Hijazi, who is going to co-chair with me, and uh, we are not going to take a long time. We are going to start immediately with the first lecture. The first lecture will be talking about critical congenital heart disease in the neonate. Uh, I would like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Ghassan Shaath. Dr. Ghassan Shaath, he is a consultant in our pediatric cardiac ICU uh, in King Abdelaziz Medical City, graduated from Damascus University in 1996. He had his, his uh, uh, pediatric uh, diploma in child health uh, in 2000, and he's a member of the Royal College of Pediatric and Child Health Health uh, MRCP UK 2004, uh, got his Arab board in pediatric 2004, and he finished his pediatric uh, cardiology fellowship uh, in King Abdelaziz Medical City 2007. It has been a pleasure actually to have Dr. Ghassan as one of our colleague in uh, uh, consultant in the pediatric cardiac ICU. Uh, he has a lot of uh, interest in uh, ultrasounds. Uh, he had uh, uh, it was a pleasure actually to publish with him actually many papers to work on many research and uh, uh, he is a really talented uh, uh, speaker. I'm looking forward to hear from him uh, about the critical congenital heart disease in the unit. Uh, Dr. Ghassan, the, the microphone. Much, thank, you. thank you and thank you for giving me the chance and having me with you tonight. Uh, maybe we'll not waste too much time appreciating the team giving me this chance tonight. Uh, uh, probably this lecture will make it as introduction for the criticality, a critical congenital heart disease in unit as a pre-operative consideration, considerations and concepts that we probably will, will, uh, will discuss. Uh, I may ask uh, Dr. Ali uh, to run the survey uh, uh, poll, then we can uh, have an idea about the uh, practice in children pre-operatively especially with uh, critical congenital heart disease. Please, Dr. Ali, if you can. Maybe we'll give the, uh, if the, the these are the three questions survey for the participants. Uh, if you can, probably each question would need something like 10 to 15 seconds to answer. Then yeah. we would. Uh, Dr. Hassan, thank you so much. I think uh, we have technical issue. Um, we probably are not able to share it all no. uh, at this stage. We may pass it uh, okay. uh, later on whenever it will be ready. Fine. Thank you so much. So, now, uh, and, uh, probably we'll go through the, these questions during, during the presentation. 
uh, having having said that, probably in our uh, I'm I'm from this uh, this cardiac center. Probably uh, have no conflict of interest, and there is no fund that is closed. Uh, the objective of presentation starts with the definition of a critical congenital heart disease, and then we'll go through some certain subtypes without going through a detailed uh, diagnostic uh, complexity of congenital heart disease with obstructive lesions, low cardiac output, or restricted pulmon or obstruction to the pulmonary flow or high cardiac output lesions. And then we'll go through certain procedures and tests, and probably intervention like feeding and screening tests, and probably as well as we'll discuss uh, some, we'll have through some talk through, uh, for the balloon atrial surfacing. Critical congenital heart disease simply, and that's the easiest and probably the, the an interested, uh, interested definition, is a structural heart disease that required emergent intervention whether by surgery or cath during the early days of life to prevent death or to minimize the morbidities. Heart disease, as we know, between 1 to 1.5 percent in live births, we have child with congenital heart disease. Majority are with mild forms. But uh, of interest, uh, 25, one fourth of them, they die in the first month of life. And that makes it very critical that you diagnose, establish, and probably deal with these cases. More than half of them, they die in the first 10 days, and the one third of them are with fatal congenital heart disease and cyanosis. The presentation varies, and actually the presentation now, part of the presentation is the presentation with the screening program tests, like an undetected congenital heart disease, which is a larger proportion, like a neonatal critical congenital heart disease, hyperoxia test and so on, and clinical examination as well. One of the, uh, one in 10 patients develop symptoms before the first neonatal screening exam. And that makes more than 50% they are passed as normal in neonatal exam, despite they have congenital heart disease. Uh, Near half of them develop symptoms or die before the routine examination check for a will baby during the first vaccination uh, shot, whether in six weeks earlier and currently at eight weeks. Fetal echo probably is probably considered one of the most efficient uh, for any suspicious pregnancy, but it needs a high index of suspicion by uh, an ultrasonographer, uh, a trained ob gyne ultrasonographer. Now, uh, the presentation varies, and um, probably the most, the most important the presentation as from this all the study in the last, uh, from the last century showed in the first uh, one to two months of life, the presentation is the most important and the one that, that requires, uh, requires intervention. And the mode of a presentation in congenital heart disease varies from asymptomatic heart murmur, which is in most of the cases, and growth failure that appears later on, and pulmonary edema as well, which also happens after the first two months of life. We'll see why. And probably shock, shock and cyanosis are the main presenting features that may lead to, may, may endanger the patient's, the baby's life during the first few weeks of life. And uh, in children with cyanosis, I, I just put this cartoon to remind you that we need at least five to six grams of non-oxygenated blood to be shown in order to show it as a clinical symptom. Now, having an anemic patient may, may pass without detecting cyanotic, patient, cyanotic subjects. In the same way, if we have a polycythemic patient, they may have uh, more than six grams of non-oxygenated blood normally, and they may present you with cyanosis while they don't have cyanotic heart disease. In the usual presentation with, with at, the middle, at the middle bar, where we have a hemoglobin between 13 to 15, five to six grams of non-oxygenated blood will show to you as cyanosis. Now, that's the usual presentation in a systemic out of flow obstruction children. They present to you in shock, uh, they are sweating, though they don't have uh, good sweating uh, uh, glands yet. Probably they have become tachycardic, hypotensive. This is a life case where we were during, during my training in cardiology and cardiac intensive care. The patient will be in a borderline saturation and, though, and so on, probably with very active procodium. The usual presentation, few, uh, maybe one or two weeks old, the new toxic looking, ash leaf color, 
probably in respiratory distress, and probably frequently they come with undetected blood pressure. And here I want to emphasize having a saturation of 92 without having a good waveform by pulse oximeter doesn't mean that the patient is, this is the right saturation. This is a, a fake destructive saturation. Probably we have to review and detecting femoral pulse here by clinician is very important. Now, uh, having uh, aortic atresia, critical aortic stenosis, uh, arch, aortic arch obstruction, mitral atresia, all are presentation for obstruction at the left side of the heart or systemic outflow obstruction. In all of these cases, we need to restore the ductus arteriosus in order to maintain the obstruction and to bypass the obstruction to maintain the flow to the body. And that's the usual presentation for children with the, for children with the, with coarctation. Usually there's supposed to be significant posterior shelf. Probably you can see abnormal, abnormal aortic arch and uh, having a, a trained intensivist with the point of care ultrasound for what we call it cardiac ultrasound or in other meaning echo with for a point of, at, at the point of care for the child would be very helpful for the physician to detect what is the problem. Uh, for example, here, a critical aortic stenosis, a little blood passes through the aortic valve. So at it, once the duct starts to constrict, the patient will present to us to uh, 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 critically ill in, in shock and our respiratory distress. Uh, any obstruction, as, as, as probably I mentioned before, would lead to significantly increased left atrial pressure and significantly increased left side of the heart in the acidic pressure. And that will ultimately need to increase back pressure on the pulmonary veins and the patient presents to you in severe pulmonary edema. So that happens uh, probably within hours or probably maximum 24 hours after the duct constricts and start to close. Uh, having the BDA restored and uh, uh, relieving the left arterial pressure probably is very essential and those children to relieve, to decrease the back pressure at the pulmonary veins and subsequently the pulmonary edema. This is the presentation for a child. You, we can appreciate from the little, little point of care cardiac ultrasound, if we call it, or echo, we can see how depressed is the function, how small is the left ventricle, how small the left, left is the mitral valve, the same way for this subject as well. And both of those, those patients present in, in shock and then neonatal neurotherapy. To summarize, probably restore circulation with the fluids and prostaglandin infusion, massage if a bradycardia starts, because bradycardia is the, is the presentation usually that, start, that starts with the, where, where before, the heart, before the heart stops working. Securing airway, even if it's still compensating. So if the patient is still breathing or having the difficulty of breathing, securing the airway and uh, sealing the alveoli with positive pressure ventilation may significantly help those patients from getting out and breaking this vicious cycle and uh, the decreasing the demand in the heart and uh, decrease the, uh, the respiratory load. Uh, minding you, some patients, they decide to arrest at the time of intubation. Probably you need to be prepared and they make the family as well ready. Balloon arterial septosomy, as I mentioned, and if in severe and if severe aortic stenosis we need, we might need to balloon. And that's the procedure. We go through the uh, femoral vein, the IVC, through the li little communication between the at both atriums and try to pull the balloon in order to relieve the obstruction of the left of the left atrium. And hence that would help decreasing the left atrial pressure and relieving Relieving, relieving the uh, pulmonary congestion. Another uh, scenario for a pulmonary flow obstruction, three-day-old cyanose, hemodynamically usually okay, especially if the obstruction at the proximal, at the proximal part of the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary vascular bed. Usually the patient is okay, the saturation might be very low with no significant respiratory distress, maybe a little distress for the acidosis. In all of these scenarios, we need as well the BDA to restore the circulation toward to uh, increase the flow to the pulmonary, uh, to the lungs through the pulmonary artery. Core triatriatum and tricuspid aortic uh, 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 trans, uh, abnormal uh, total anomalous pulmonary venous return to the heart, uh, whether infracardiac or uh, supracardiac with obstruction 
may present with uh, cyanosis as well and obstruction at the distal part of the uh, of the vascular bed. And hence, uh, in those scenarios, uh, the, there was a myth we, which we believe, and we I was I I, I grew in while we, I know that we should not start prostaglandin in children with total anomalous pulmonary venous obstruction. And probably we'll try to uh, to differentiate between obstruction at the proximal part of the vascular bed and from the distal part. And the distal part, we can appreciate the presence of snowman appearance or the con uh, or the presence of the vertical vein that appears in the uh, in the supra cardiac total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. But in the same way, they may not present with snowman appearance. They may present with a florid clitoric lungs. And uh, that, that has a special presentation probably uh, in infracardiac. Most uh, probably we don't need to go through details of this uh, because probably many people are not trained uh, performing ECHO for similar, similar procedure. Now, uh, uh, that's what we need in, in all ch in child with the proximal obstruction uh, for, pulmonary, uh, for pulmonary flow. Uh, we, need, we need the prostaglandin. We might need to perform arterial septostomy to relieve the right arterial pressure in order to maintain uh, systemic flow to the uh, flow, venous flow to the left side of the heart and subsequently to the system. Or distal obstruction, where we have pulmonary venous obstruction as an example, maybe starting the prostaglandin is not contraindicated as what most of us think, opening the venous uh, ductus venosus and maintaining ductus flow to, to the body to help hemodynamics. Uh, probably uh, balloon arterial subtosomy is not uh, is not of concern in this in this scenario. Now, why I want to concentrate on this entity, total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage and prostaglandin, because many of us we receive a, a unit who is in shock where we don't know what's what's going on, and we might not have the facility performing an echo uh, quickly in order to know. And many of the of the eminent uh, eminent pediatric cardiology references. They mentioned that the prostaglandin may have a benefit by uh, restoring the ductus venosus and maybe it results in an increased portent and pulmonary venous, uh, venous uh, pr pressure. And that probably would relax the smooth muscle and the ductus venosus and relieves the constriction. Same way, it, uh, opening the, uh, the, pet the ductus arteriosus would, uh, would revive the systemic blood flow uh, from obstruction and from, from the pulmonary vascular bed in order to improve the uh, systemic flow. Uh, so in that in that reference, they, there is at the present no good evidence contraindicating the use of prostaglandin in infants with obstructed pulmonary veins in acidrenic. So to summarize uh, in a special concern, in any neonate in shock, and that was published actually in pediatric emergency medicine and one, one of the eminent uh, journals that IV fluid in smaller volumes or, or in longer time, inotropes, IV antibiotics in the first hour, because we don't know whether the patient is septic or not. Diuresis, uh, and here we have to emphasize, is not the drug of, 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 for all congenital heart disease, especially when the patient is dynamically unstable or in shock or hypotensive. If edema ensues, intubate and seal the alveoli, and probably you might need to keep giving smaller volumes with longer, in longer time, and starting prostaglandin until further notice and advices by the cardiologist. Now, uh, pulmonary flow obstruction uh, with an entity of persist of, of persistent pulmonary hypertension of a newborn that our colleagues in neonatology they they face frequently and, con and congenital diaphragmatic hernia and so on. Pulmonary hypertension does not cause cyanosis per se, unless there is a mixing of non-oxygenated blood to the oxygenated side like VQ snatching at the lung level in uh, meconium patient, or from right to left shunt across the BFO or ASD or BSD. And that makes, that actually increases the cyanosis, but the pulmonary hypertension itself, it doesn't make the cyanosis. Unstable hemodynamic patient with persist, uh, persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, like uh, whom are oligiuric, acidotic, and et cetera, maybe uh, traditionally they are started in nitric oxide, and we try always to normalize their, 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 their pH. Uh, some of us probably may start IV, IV sodium by car uh, while watching the sodium. Inotropes are very important, but accepting lower saturation to minimize lung injury probably is, is a, wise, a wise consideration. 
Here, I want to emphasize on this point of starting the prostaglandin might, need, might be needed to maintain ductus arteriosus to maintain the systemic flow through the ductus. As far as the obstruction from the flow from the lungs, uh, the only exit for the pulmonary hypertension is through the BDA after we restore it, like after starting prostaglandin. That's the usual representation for the bedside uh, ultrasound point of care or echo where we can appreciate the significant in dilatation of the right ventricle, right atrium, uh, probably even a bowing septum toward the left side with a, D, a classical D-shaped left ventricle indicating the suprasystemic pulmonary hypertension with uh, unmet, probably the uh, hemodynamics are not maintained, most probably in this patient. Having a tricuspid regurgitation here can give us an estimation number for the right ventricle systolic pressure and subsequent people in the systolic pressure. This is the, a reminder cartoon for uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine early in this century, where they put a three arms of uh, treating pulmonary hypertension patient, the arm of cyclic A and B with the prostacycline and the arm with cyclic G and B with nitric oxide and uh, sildenafil. And the third arm comes with the uh, endothelium uh, receptor antagonism. Uh, a little reminder that uh, some of the uh, evidence-based clinical practice since uh, since 2010 indicating to us that it is recommended recommended to stop nitric oxide if 60 minutes showed no increase in BAO2 or oxygenation index. But uh, probably that becomes very difficult for uh, in, in real life for a clinician who is having uh, a very critical child and not maintaining hemodynamic, especially if the nitric oxide is not adding harm and the methemoglobin is in, in, in controlled level. Now, uh, high cardiac output lesions are different. So we finished from systemic outflow obstruction, pulmonary out, pulmonary obstruction, proximal and distal, and then we'll move to high cardiac output lesions where the heart has to go with a higher output to maintain hemodynamics, which might be related to leak, like distributive shock in sepsis or anaphylaxis or in shunt lesions like VD, VSD and BDA. Those legions are uh, with non-cyanotic like BSD, BDA, or AB window, or that might, they might be cyanotic like in truncus arteriosus, or a patient with AB window, but they are sh shunting right, uh, right to left. Uh, the diagnostic frequency is usually in high, uh, high output uh, shunt legions like VSD, for example, doesn't appear usually in the early, early days of life because of increased pulmonary vascular resistance in children naturally uh, in the in pulmonary vascular bed. And that starts to decrease after, uh, after two, uh, two, uh, two months to 10, month, two, 10 weeks of age. And in that scenario, we, uh, in, the, in those children, we, the heart has to compensate for the leak through the shunt. Uh, a, little, a little scheme for you to understand that if we have from the left atrium, two cardiac output comes through the left ventricle, one cardiac output goes to the aorta and the other goes to the back to the lungs, and that will induce high lift and lift at the lift arterial pressure. And from there, the lift heart failure ensues, and we have the pulmonary AD. Uh, having said that, one of the maneuvers to treat it is to decrease the systemic vascular resistance in order to decrease the, uh, the shunt through the VSD by adding, for example, uh, ACE inhibitors and probably diuresing with those patients. That's what we face in left side heart failure. So a, a little reminder, all children, with, uh, all, all chambers that receive the excessive volume during their study, like left atrium or left ventricle, would dilate subsequently due to volume overload at the left side of the heart. And that's what we mean from left side heart failure. Having, uh, having, having a BDA. So for all children with shunt below the arterioventricular valve, below the tricuspid or mitral, if we have a VSD, if we have a truncus arteriosus, if we have a BDA or AB window, their left side of the heart would dilate. And that's the secret for all intensivists who's repairing a shunt legion patient who's sick. If you get a, a report of a VSD, the next question comes, uh, comes uh, subsequently, is this shunt sig hemodynamically significant? Do we have ch chamber dilatation that indicates the significance of this shunt? And that's the, the, the other, the third or fourth message that I did to my colleagues from uh, intensive care 
to get from this, this presentation. You can see, appreciate the left side heart failure and the dilatation of the, of the chambers that indicate to us how, how high, how, how hemodynamically significant is the shock. That's a pancreas arteriosus. And that's what we appreciate in children with, the, with shunt lesion, especially if, the, uh, if they have increased volume and subsequent pulmonary hypertension. To summarize a, a little hints for neonatologists and probably intensivists as well, all patients with shunt lesion and pulmonary hypertension, but this pulmonary hypertension is volume related and it might get all the way to Eisenmenger once we get through the pulmonary vascular bed disease and vascular constriction then it becomes a, a, a pulmonary hypertension that's uh, maybe intractable or irreversible or what we call it is a major syndrome. BDA and AB window uh, or truncus arteriosus are influencing larger shunt. With these are shunts, these shunts are beyond the semilunar valves and it induces a larger shunt through the whole cardiac cycle and subsequently the pulmonary hypertension might, might ensue earlier. The usually TAMs, TAMs, TAM babies have increased pulmonary vascular resistance, so they don't show you a, sig a significant left side heart failure or pulmonary edema till they pass their, uh, their six or eight weeks of life. But uh, so, uh, surprisingly, the BTAMs don't behave so because they don't tolerate chunks as TAM. The, a little, little uh, BDA of a three millimeter might keep the baby uh, and, uh, with, with extubation failures and increase congestion. The cardiac chamber that would dilate is the one that receives the volume, excessive volume during diastole. So uh, below aort ventricular valve, like as in mitral, I mean, BDA, VSD, and so on, well, the excess volume is received in the LA and LV, hence they dilate. The, in contrary, the chance above the arterioventicular valves, like ASD, total anomalous, partial, partial anomalous, they have a right side failure or right side dilatation, like what we see in this example. And both of them may present to you with pulmonary edema early in the disease. And from there, we can understand and go through our management based on the pulmonary hypertension that if it's related to volume, that they need diuresis, probably a little restriction of oxygen, and maybe to give, uh, no, we should not give pulmonary vasodilator. We, we rather should increase the pulmonary vascular, vascular uh, constriction. And, the, uh, and vice versa goes all the way with pulmonary hypertension due to constriction. constriction. A little talk about TGA in patient with circular, uh, with parallel circulation. Uh, so the oxygenated blood goes back to the lungs and the non-oxygenated goes, uh, goes back to the body and comes back to the, uh, to the right ventricle. The only way to improve communication and mixing in those patients is through the arterial communication. The BDA probably is very important, but B duct is not the main source of communication. The aim of BDA is to increase the shunt and subsequently increase the left arterial pressure, as I mentioned, and that would increase the shunt from the left arterial all the way to right atrium through, uh, by, uh, through arterial communication. From there, maybe uh, we uh, probably pulmonary uh, balloon arterial subtosomy is essential, even if we restore the BDA in children with restricted arterial communication and uh, with simple TGA. And that's what we see usually in children at the point of care ultrasound or echo during uh, when we receive them uh, in severe cyanosis. Uh, the, uh, so emphasizing about the, uh, the aim of starting prostaglandin is to maintain BDA open. And mixing is not, you know, is not through the BDA. It rather goes from oxygenated, from non-oxygenated to oxygenated. So we don't get our mixing there. The main mixing comes from arterial communication and after balloon arterial septosomy, a little, a little experience and message that we faced that probably we need to maintain prostaglandin. And that's uh, actually, that's from the uh, pool and survey that I tried to run for my colleagues. And that was actually mentioned in more than, more than one article. So uh, uh, balloon arterial septosomy, is main question again is, is uh, do we induce a brain injury? when we perform balloon arterial septosomy preoperatively in those children. Actually, some even surgeon uh, be, believes that it may make his uh, surgery longer, uh, especially if the arterial communication is large. 
And from there, uh, this study actually was uh, published a long time back and uh, more, than, more than 10 years. And it showed that 26, 26 units with TGA and cyanotic, they all had MRI preoperative. And 38 of them, they have hypoxic brain injury with periventricular leukomalacia even before we touch them. 14 of them had balloon arterial, so 14 out of the 26 had balloon arterial septosomy. No stroke was detected for all. And hypoxic brain injury was detected even before, not correlated to balloon septosomy. And it was correlated to lower preoperative saturation and probably longer time uh, for uh, during uh, arterial, uh, arterial switch operation. Another question comes, uh, comes as about feeding, which is the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis, which happens in, uh, in mostly in preemies. But uh, subsequently, we found that in patients with cardiac lesion, they have an increased risk of uh, arterial flow uh, lability, and that may make them, might make them, uh, for, uh, might make them vulnerable for necrotizing enterocolitis as, as, as uh, due to their cardiac lesion. Then the question comes, uh, should we feed or we shouldn't feed? We know that feeding may not aggravate or provoke neck, but having neck or prediction of neck and then uh, uh, complex it with the, uh, add, adding to complicate that with feeding, that might make the neck even serious and might induce further peritonitis and so on. In this study, 200, 215 units survey was done in more than 10, 10 centers in North America. Uh, uh, maybe they, they, they uh, almost one fourth of them hypoplastic heart obstructed uh, aortic obstruction and TGA. More than 50% of them were fed uh, within two days of life, and 50% were also fed postoperatively within two days of life. Except in hypoplastic heart, they were fed at four days of life because they come to the ICU critically. 3% uh, of them, they develop neck. And believe it or not, only 1% preoperatively and 2% postoperatively. To come a conclusion, uh, shall we feed or we shouldn't feed? We don't have a clear directive or clear evidence that tells you that feeding those patients wouldn't expose them to a complicated necrotizing enterocarditis if it is uh, ensured. Uh, neonatal critical congenital heart disease screening is uh, is becoming uh, by pulse oximeter is becoming more fa more familiar. Um, probably in Minister of Health in the Kingdom Saudi Arabia, they start to uh, to uh, uh, to take this as, as part of the national program. The aim is to have to see if there is uh, uh, it is usually performed between 24 to 36 hours and to detect the pulse oximeter between right hand and lower any of the lower limb. Any difference in saturation, uh, any saturation that's less than 90, or any difference in saturation between the limbs by, by more than 3%, or any difference in the pulse oxy, pulse satellite index of more than 10% will make the test as possible. And that requires uh, pediatric cardiology. And that in this review, they mentioned they showed that pair uh, children with positive uh, false positive rate in both the clinical and pulse oximetry. It's 40 percent, but the but point, the point that a, clinic, a clinical referral is almost more than 10 times the referral from the pulse oximetry. Uh, probably we are not yet establishing the uh, protocol. The and the Ministry of Health they are still connecting the co collecting the data after starting uh, starting those patients. Uh, still false negative uh, is there in uh, in less than 0.1 percent are missed and being labeled as negative, uh, negative uh, uh, screening test, but still they have uh, serious congenital heart disease. Probably I'll uh, stop here. The hyperoxia test probably is a family, you are familiar, most of you are familiar with it. Uh, maybe for just to save the time, uh, maybe now, by now I finished more than 30, 30 minutes in my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, very, very much, um, thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. I wish I catch with time. Uh, you, you are fine. You are fine. Thank you very much. We really appreciate the, the uh, uh, very informative uh, information that you, you have given us and the controversial uh, subject that you talk about it and enlightened us uh, about a critical issue in the management of 
pre-operative uh, critical cardiac patient. I will leave the question to the break and uh, uh, in the break, stay with us, uh, if you don't mind, please. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce my next uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Abdurraouf Jija. Dr. Abdurraouf Jija, he is a consultant pediatric uh, uh, cardiac intensivist, and he, he is uh, my colleague in the pediatric cardiac ICU of King Abdulaziz Medical City. He graduated from Aleppo University in Syria, 1998, and he got his uh, Saudi board pediatric 2004, uh, Arab Board of Pediatric 2007, and he has he completed his pediatric cardiology fellowship in 2009. Uh, he has been with us working as a consultant uh, for at least seven years. And uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Abdraouf Jija actually he is really talented also in uh, uh, ultrasound and uh, uh, introducing the ultrasound concept and procedures. Uh, in critical care area. Uh, he taught many of our staff and uh, uh, his skills in the ultrasound has been extremely useful uh, in the management of patient. Uh, he has written many papers and uh, uh, it was a pleasure actually to join him actually in many of his papers with many national and international presentation. Dr. Uh, Jija is going to talk about uh, uh, the concept of predictors of reopening the sternum in the children after cardiac surgery. Uh, I think his lecture is going to reflect uh, a little bit, probably some of the uh, uh, experience that opened the sternum. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamad, for uh, this introduction. Uh, the voice is clear? Yes. Dr. Hamad, okay. Yes. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, everybody. Uh, good evening. Uh, uh, as Dr. Muhammad mentioned, uh, we'll uh, speak briefly uh, about predictors of uh, reopening the sternum in children uh, after cardiac uh, surgery. As you know, open heart surgery uh, may induce capillary leak syndrome. And this is most likely uh, induced by cytotoxins release. Capillary syndrome will uh, introduce to a some uh, extent myocardial edema. Uh, and this edema may prevent uh, or hinder the sternum closure. So this is what we call, uh, what we call it a tight chest, chest syndrome or uh, mediastinal uh, tamponade. Delayed sternum closure can be either in cardiac OR or in the intensive care unit. So if the surgeon after the surgery in cardiac OR uh, uh, had hemodynamic instability for the patient, could not uh, close uh, the sternum, so they will keep it open and this is what we call a primary delayed sternal closure. If the sternum was closed and patient transferred to the pediatric cardiac ICU, uh, sometimes capillary syndrome presentation uh, may present later on in hours uh, during the uh, first 48 hours. So uh, if the patient required reopening the sternum in the ICU, we call it secondary delayed sternal closure. And also, uh, it is the same as reopening the sternum. Uh, opening the sternum for a patient who is hemodynamically unstable after congenital heart disease, uh, most of the time will help in st stabilizing the hemodynamics of the patient. So the question was, uh, uh, is there any uh, predictors uh, which can predict, predict which patient required uh, reopening the sternum? This is the group actually uh, which we uh, studied uh, uh, with Dr. Shaz. Uh, <clears throat> so we, uh, we studied the predictors of reopening the sternum in children uh, after cardiac surgery. It, it was a retrospective uh, cohort study. Over six years, uh, we... Uh, collected all the cases who required reopening the sternum in the pediatric cardiac ICU. Total uh, 
congenital heart disease was almost 3,000 cases during that uh, time. So we collected 33 cases, presenting 1% of the uh, children who had congenital heart surgery who required reopening uh, the sternum. For each index case, we, uh, to compare uh, other normal cases, we collected uh, uh, two control cases for each index case uh, with a total of 63. Uh, there was three cases we could not uh, get a matching uh, group. And those control cases were matching the index cases in age, weight, and uh, the adjusted risk uh, score. So after cardiac surgery, in the index cases, the time of reopening the sternum we considered as the zero hours, the zero hour. And for the control group, we define the zero hour as the maximum uh, inotropic score. Before the zero hour, six hourly, we collected the uh, hemodynamics variables and laboratory variables just six hours uh, and 12 hours before uh, the zero hour. And we uh, try to find if there is any uh, uh, hemodynamic or laboratory variables can predict reopening the sternum. Both groups were uh, comparable uh, regarding the weight around uh, seven. <laughs> نعم. دكتور عمر آه حجازي حياك الله. آه آه I guess the mic is working for دكتور عمر. دكتور عبد الرؤوف. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. yeah. حياك الله دكتور. Yes. So uh, both <تصفيق> groups, uh, index case and control cases were uh, uh, similar uh, <clears throat> regarding the weight around seven to eight kilograms and age around two years. And also the uh, risk-adjusted congenital heart score, RAX score, the median was three for both groups. Uh, the percentage of single uh, ventricle uh, physiology was almost similar, 20 to 30 uh, percent. So uh, in the variables six hours before the uh, zero hour, we noticed that the uh, high temperature gap between the central and uh, skin temperature was significantly higher in the index cases. Inotropic score was higher as well. And there was evidence of acute kidney injury of, in form of uh, high urea and creatinine. Just before the zero hours, the zero hour, there was significant uh, increase in the cases who required reopening the sternum, significant increase in the CVP, uh, inotropic score was very high for those, if you, you can see here, 34 score here, comparing to nine only. And also the evidence of acute kidney injury was more clear uh, in form of increasing further urea and creatinine, uh, as well lactic acid was, uh, was higher. The outcome after uh, opening the sternum and also a follow up in other cases, as expected, uh, those cases who had open sternum, they have longer uh, ICU stay, uh, uh, mean of uh, 26 days, and longer positive pressure ventilation. And also almost uh, one third of them required ECMO, 11 cases out of 33 required ECMO. Uh, infections were similar actually in our uh, population. Uh, the, the opening the sternum did, did not increase the risk, the, the rate of surgical site infection. And also bloodstream infection and ventilator associated pneumonia were similar in both groups. Mortality was much higher in the opening sternum group uh, 27 percent mortality, total of nine cases. And I will mention some details about the mortality uh, in this group. 
So as we mentioned, there was uh, 33 patients had reopening of the sternum uh, uh, compared to 63 patient control cases. 11 uh, patients required ECMO, 73% uh, mortality from the ECMO uh, group, eight uh, patients had mortality. If there is no ECMO, the mortality was comparable actually. If the ECMO was not required, uh, only one case is here out of 22, 5% without ECMO. And the control group was 3%, 2 out of 63. So uh, requiring ECMO after opening the sternum had increased significantly the mortality rate. So in conclusion, low cardiac output after cardiac surgery in children in form of uh, temperature gap more than three degrees, anthropic score more than 14, acute kidney injury may predict the need of reopening the sternum. Mortality was higher in the reopening sternum group when the use of ECMO was needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Abraouf, uh, for this uh, informative lecture. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce my co-chair, uh, Dr. Omar Hijazi. Dr. Omar, are you with us? Yeah, yes, um, thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Okay. Maybe we can have some few questions. We can have some few questions uh, from the audience. We have, I think, five minutes break. And uh, during this five minute break, uh, uh, we can have, or five to 10 minutes break, we can have a uh, few questions. Uh, if there is any question for Dr. Uh, Shaaz or Dr. Uh, Jija. I think the audience can use the raise hand option. So exactly. Yeah. So if anybody know, has question, please raise your hand. So we can we know who can uh, who would like to to discuss a point or have a question. Maybe the moderator can choose the yeah. most dominant and important question. Um, yeah. I expect. Uh, so guys. Uh, uh, you can raise your hand if you have any question. Dr. Abdullah Tayyip. Okay. Dr. Abdullah Tayyip, uh, you can unmute yourself, can you? Assalamu alaikum, Sal Khair. Wa alaikum, Salam, Dr. Abdullah, Kif Halak. Alhamdulillah. Very, 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 very informative, very rich topics, really. We enjoyed it all. Thank you so much, uh, the organizers and the presenter. Pleasure. Uh, I know we are going to have the uh, ultrasound in the next sessions, two sessions. But I have a question to Dr. Uh, Dr. Hassan. Uh, because you mentioned um, about the neck in the neonatus critical congenital heart disease, especially the left-sided lesion. Yeah. So you as group in National Guard and exhibit ultrasound, are you using um, ultrasound to predict neck for the gut perfusion, if you are planning to start uh, the feeding for this critical patient, especially in units that uh, here are now moving to do ultrasound for uh, neck evaluation uh, to predict the risk for neck and these things. So I know that it will, may it may come in the next, uh, if it's coming in the next uh, talk, that is fine, so we can wait. But if it's not coming, I need to hear about your experience and your, your thought especially we have a neonatal candidate here in the room. Thank you. Uh, I can answer Dr. Hamad. Thank Go you, ahead. Dr. Abdullah. And uh, it's a pleasure having, having an experienced, mashallah, consultant with us like you, Dr. Abdullah, and maybe Ali, and all the groups from Prince Sultan, King Fahad Medical City, and from King Faisal as well. Uh, actually, we encountered with the group uh, in, since 2008, uh, probably two articles they mentioned about the uh, color doubler or power doubler for, uh, for the gut. But all of these, uh, all of these, all of these uh, reports and uh, projects were uh, descriptive and they mentioned uh, case scenarios. And are they, most of them are case reports. Till now, we don't have uh, an evidence that tells that uh, X patient would have neck because his doubler, color doubler or power doubler ultrasound or 
uh, a Venus Doppler is showing so and so. We don't have this as evidence to tell this patient will have neck or not. So it's a very valid question that and uh, predicting uh, a patient to have neck or not to have a neck is very important. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I'm not aware about any study, uh, unless maybe Dr. Qabbani, Dr. Hijazi, or uh, colleagues like Dr. Samih or uh, Raouf are very uh, also uh, interesting. Uh, they are very interested about this subject. We can't tell by evidence when do we have neck or we don't by uh, using point of care ultrasound to the moment. So what we have is our only literature or case reports in the study, in the, in the literature, that's all. Yes. If we if we have any neonatologists with us here, that is uh, uh, like I in the last. Hands, please. Yes, they are more than welcome. Yeah, in the last five years, it became like a new era that uh, I have just finished a neonatal fellowship in Canada. That they are doing this uh, ultrasound screening for critical patients who may develop neck by Doppler, and they have criteria for that. They have that what's called zebra lines and this one. But I'm just asking in the cardiac setting, is it no. advisable to start this uh, screening um, in critical yeah. patient? Because we are all fear. And, and uh, interestingly, you mentioned that in your presentation that the neck risk is very low in that uh, study. It is only three patients, two of them was surgery, one of them pre-surgery, which is very interesting. It removes the fear of starting feeding. Actually, they refer that feeding has no, uh, no, does not influence more cases of neck. That's what they try to emphasize in the circulation in 2009. But if there are some of the, uh, and, you know, our colleagues in neonatology probably, or you, Dr. Abdullah, if you have something to tell about uh, in, uh, for point of care in short, because maybe there, there, will, there are many raised hands, uh, Dr. Muhammad Shahzad yeah. and Dr. Okay. Rai. Thank you. If you can teach us something, fine. Uh, can we take can we take the question of Mr. Uh, yes. of uh, Dr. Muhammad Shahzad? Yes. You can unmute yourself, Dr. Muhammad. Shahzad. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Can you hear yes, me? Dr. Yes, I can hear. You. Yes, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Shahzad from King Faisal. I want to ask from Dr. Abdul Rauf actually the question: Is he available? Yes. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah uh, Mr. Abdurrahman, your study is uh, very uh, excellent and uh, your, your data is also very, uh, uh, any, uh, is experienceable and also the goods. Uh, so uh, I, I just want to ask that uh, uh, about the predictors. You mentioned about the inotropic score, the inotropic score of 14. Uh, so to our knowledge, it, it, is it looking a low threshold for uh, opening the uh, sternum because the 14 score is, uh, is a low score. So is it okay, Yanni? Because we experience that sometimes the patients are having the more inotropic score, but they can handle the hemodynamics and they improve. So what do you think about it? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, excellent question. Yeah, actually the number itself uh, will not indicate uh, opening the sternum. Uh, usually the clinical uh, scenario will be uh, a baby post operatively, who is not uh, passing uh, good urine and acute kidney injury, uh, requiring uh, higher and higher anaerobic support. Uh, you start to, to double your doses, uh, add uh, fair, second anaerobic, third uh, anaerobic support, and uh, still uh, you don't achieve uh, achieve uh, good hemo, uh, hemodynamics. So uh, probably at that. Uh, stage, uh, you will uh, call the surgeon to consider reopening the sternum because uh, if you reach uh, uh, more than three doses of anitropes, you started steroid, uh, patient is not uh, doing well up and down blood pressure, uh, kidney is not working, acute kidney injury. At that stage, you will start to think about uh, opening the sternum. And if you observe, maybe you are right, uh, we choose the cutoff uh, point 14 uh, as it was significantly statistical significant. But if you uh, observe the, the opening sternum group, uh, the, the average of the inotropic score was 34. 
So they really had very high uh, anitrobe uh, score. The, most of them on triple uh, medication. Uh, most of them uh, start on steroid, but uh, 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 at that stage, we called the surgeon to, to reopen uh, their uh, Okay, okay, okay. You so any the thirty four is the um, any is your that, cut value in? Yeah, in the case that, group? that that was the average for the group uh, of, uh, okay. of the reopening the sternum. So it was okay. a high anatomic score. If you allow okay. me, Dr. Abderouf, also okay. to share. Uh, uh, so he's the leader. The study. Yes, thank you very much. You were main, one of the main investigators. Oh, Actually, having, having an inotropic score, probably Dr. Mohammed Shahzad, is a relatively very high dose. Very high. It's not, it's a, it's a collective formula probably available, and uh, uh, that formula uh, gives you the sum of. Uh, epinephrine or epinephrine and vasopressin includes even the bamine and dubitamine in case they are they are included in the inotropic so it's collectively uh, a number that tells about it so having an inotropic score of 10 even high uh, are are relatively high doses having 14 are even touching a very high uh, number of maximum probably of epinephrine and uh, maybe in half of the maximum dose in epinephrine and maximum vasopressin that's probably my my contribution. Otherwise, mashallah, Dr. Rauf presented better than what should, what what I I'll I'll do. Mashallah, he is a good, excellent presenter. Thank you, uh, Thank you so much. Yes. We can take we can take one more question from Dr. Raid Sadiq, and that will be the final question. And then I will give the microphone to Dr. Hijazi, my colleague, Dr. Hijazi. Dr. Raid. Can we unmute Dr. Raid? Also, Dr. Abdullah Wadi, he would like also to raise a question. Salam alaikum. Salam. 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 Amazing uh, lectures. My question regarding uh, uh, the use of prostaglandin in total anomalous of the pulmonary venous drainage, as Dr. Ghassan nicely uh, presented. My question to Dr. Ghassan uh, uh, Does the type of obstruction or non obstructive will uh, make the things changed? I think if it is obstructed, maybe still it will be uh, not useful and even. Maybe some harm because if you, if there is obstruction, uh, the flow of, uh, through the ductus uh, will be uh, not uh, there, uh, and it might get things worse. Maybe it is uh, more helpful if uh, if it is uh, uh, in the obstructive type. Is does it make difference the presence of obstruction or non obstruction? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, to start with, an unobstructed TAVBD, they should not come to you in a very bad case scenario. So if you have a TAVBD, the only presentation will be cyanosis. Uh, otherwise, uh, that's a very important consideration. So what we are talking about is a unit who comes to you in respiratory failure or shock. Having a unit in shock is not usually the presentation for non-obstructive type of total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. Reminding you that uh, Dr. Bob Anderson uh, probably, and maybe Dr. Van Braag are the main morphologists that they established the science of congenital heart disease. They mentioned that all TABVD or T total anomalous patient, they are considered obstructive, even if they are not obstructive. But let's make our guide as clinicians that a unit who present to you in, in bad shape, respiratory failure or shock, and having total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage is obstructed till proven otherwise. Now, the debate starts earlier for the obstructed ones that prostaglandin might be contraindicated. And that's all our area of, uh, of discussion and distribution. The problem as a pediatrician or a critical care provider when you receive a new unit who's sick, you can't tell whether he is TABVD or he is, uh, for example, hypoplast 
or he is uh, a patient with the, with the, with the, with coarctation or interruption and constricting constricting uh, BDA. That's the main that's the main reason. That's why in th since two thousand and uh, and nine in the Journal of Pediatric Emergency, they published that. Starting antibiotics and starting prostaglandin for all in unit who comes to you in unstable hemodynamic. Till further advice by the, by the cardiologist is a recommendation. That's why I'd like to emphasize in this point. And thank you very much for this uh, highlighting this excellent question, Dr. Raid. Always Dr. Raid, our colleague from King Fahad Medical City. Thank you very, thank much. You very much. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Uh, yeah. Dr. Dr. Uh, Ali, any any further? I heard that you have Dr. Wadi. Yeah, Dr. Wadi trying to to join. Uh, 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 raise the hand, uh, so he would like to have a question for the audience. If the time is uh, uh, is uh, we can match uh, Dr. Hamid. Uh, so Dr. Abdullah, you can unmute yourself. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام. Thank you for allowing me to ask the question. I'll make it short. أول شيء I I cannot يعني thank you enough group of National Guard. You always يعني bring the يعني the high the bar very high for everybody. Thank you very much for this. I have question and a comments. We'll start with the question to Abd al-Rauf. First, congratulations for this great study. I'm not sure that I I could not find the full text. So maybe the answer in the full text, but. If you can help me and others, uh, did you find the difference between uh, those who require uh, reopening the chest in the ICU if they are if they are a right heart surgery or a left heart surgery? Uh, then, uh, out of your uh, conclusion, you came up with the predictors. Uh, can you give us a guideline to this to us to tell the surgeon if we would like them to keep the chest open from the OR so we don't need to have this. Uh, crash and opening the chest in the in the ICU. So, what type of surgery? What type of patient that you will tell the surgeon to keep the chest open from the OR? Uh, and the comment because I I'm sure that I will not have time to mention it. The I'm I'm still uh, not sure that the obstructed total anomalous require uh, prostaglandin, except if the, if it is infracardiac and it's draining below the level of the ductus venosus. That's the type, maybe that's the type will benefit from prostaglandin because it dilates both the ductus venosus and the BDA. But if the obstruction, for example, which is rare, I know in the uh, infra or supradiaphragmatic, in the, uh, in the ascending uh, vertical vein, what can happen, I don't think prostaglandin ha has any role in this type. Yes, if it is infradiaphragmatic, maybe beneficial, but other types, I don't think it's going to be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Abdira, if you'd like to answer, or uh, I'll start uh, with my part. Uh, I, maybe I will uh, have uh, a brief answer, and then you can add uh, on it, Ghassan, and comment on uh, the comment of Dr. Abdullah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah. Actually, that was in uh, our mind that maybe uh, those patients with uh, high complexity, uh, like uh, uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome or higher RAX score, maybe those are the ones uh, who need more uh, reopening uh, the sternum. But what, what we found from those who came with closed sternum to the uh, ICU, that both has a similar uh, RAX score, uh, similar age, similar weight. So we, uh, uh, we, did not, we could not predict uh, something like preoperatively to tell the surgeon uh, to keep the sternum uh, Open. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Hassan can add on. Uh, yes, um, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah. Always your contribution is uh, unique and uh, and interesting. To start with, as what Dr. Abdul Abdul for mentioned, we even uh, tried to match the to match the control with the index cases for the left side heart failure, for the right side heart failure, and we found no difference. In the uh, as a prediction to reopen the sternum or not. Now, in our study, we did not include the primary re uh, re op uh, left open chest from OR. 
we studied the patient who got secondary delayed sternal closure or reopening inside the PCICU. And we did not find any difference between the left side patient, left side heart problem patient and right side heart problem patient, or even from the mixed. What we found a little bit that a single ventricle, uh, single ventricle was not even different and single uh, it's, uh, between, between both groups. Now that's that's for the uh, for that part. So we don't have, we cannot now tell the surgeon which one to re to keep open OR and which are, because that's uh, probably another sub uh, another project that needs to, that we were actually uh, going to run it in the uh, from OR all the way to ICU. Now, if it comes to the second question from Dr. Abdullah, I appreciate your comment. From your comment, we conclude number one that. Uh, uh, starting prostaglandin is not harmful. So we agreed on this, both of us. Number two, that probably having a, a critical care provider in ER or in the ICU, general pediatric intensivists, who cannot establish diagnosis, even cardiologists, they need quite time to establish the diagnosis, whether uh, it is post-ductus spinosus or pre-ductus spinosus, probably is not, uh, is not possible, even by echo. It needs uh, probably sometimes even cath or CT angio to define where is the position of infracardiac uh, of infracardiac uh, total anomalous confluence drainage. Now, if it comes to the uh, that, that it opens the ductus venosus and the BDA, probably if you if we think about hemodynamics, you would find that reopening restoring the BDA would help by maintaining the flow across the aorta from a very hypertensive pulmonary, pulmonary vascular bed. And that subsequently can improve, can decrease acidosis and probably decrease the pulmonary artery pressure, though with the lower saturated blood, but that at least would maintain the coronary flow and uh, systemic, systemic flow. This is uh, probably my answer to Dr. Uh, Dr. Abdullah in three points. Allah is <laughs> Because of the time constraint, I'm, I'm going to leave if there is any further controversial question to the end of the session. Uh, I'm going to leave the microphone now to, the, to my colleague, Dr. Omar Hijazi, so we can proceed. If there is any further question, we will leave it to, to the end of the session, inshallah. Uh, Dr. Omar, uh, the, thank the, you, Dr. The, Mahad, uh, thank you very much. And I just want to mention that, like a few points fast in regard to opening the sternum. Yani, now we, we've the, the, the outcome that we, we know that the patients who had the sternum open high, had higher mortality, but we don't know what, what will happen if we, we don't open the sternum. So it, it would be nice to see what, what will happen if these patients that mandated opening the sternum, if we don't open the sternum, what will happen to them? So mortality was high, but it will be maybe may higher. Also another point that I think in our center, we underdo it in opening, leaving the sternum open. Uh, the, the, we had only 1%. I, I know that in other, other centers, they keep most, almost all of the normal cases as open sternum. So we underdo it. Another point that Dr. Gija uh, uh, mentioned that the, uh, the uh, surgical site infection in patients who had open sternum did not differ from those who did not have open sternum. The common sense that you would expect that those who had open sternum have higher surgical site infection, but it did not happen in our study. And this is interesting. And this is not in our study only. It is there in others. So I will move to the uh, next uh, uh, two speakers, and we'll start with Dr. Hayan. Dr. Hayan is associate consultant uh, in, in, in Mediatic Cardiac ICU, King Abdulaziz uh, Medical City. He graduated from the uh, Damascus University in 2004. He had master degree um, from uh, Damascus also in 2008, Arab board in pediatrics 2009, and he is um, he's actually acting consultant in our ICU for last almost two years. He has excellent contribution, and he is playing a major role now in our cardiac transplant uh, team. He's is ma ma major player. And he put the orders, and he is is is. is uh, his contribution for the cardiac transplant is will have highly appreciated. He has many publications, and he's now going to speak about the use of point of care ultrasound uh, in, in hemodynamics. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Hayyan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Omar, for uh, this present introduction. 
Jazakum Allah Khair. And thank you uh, for you to give me the chance to speak about this important topic. Is the voice clear? Yes, Hayan. Is my... Yes, yeah, you are, you are very clear. Okay, okay. Thank you. So we are uh, going uh, to speak about uh, the point of care ultrasound for hemodynamics. Within the next uh, 30 minutes, inshallah, you will enjoy it, bismillah. Uh, starting by the importance of uh, bedside ultrasound for hemodynamically unstable patients. It can help actually to determine the etiology of shock and then provide evidence of fluid volume responsiveness and to assess patient response to intervention, which is either inotropes versus fluid. The importance of implementation of uh, bedside ultrasound, it's evidence-based in both the BICUs and adult ICUs also. Actually, the point of care ultrasound has a potential to optimize care of the critically ill patient when added to the clinical practice of intensive care physician. Our objectives will be hemodynamic assessment of the critically ill patient and the trying to answer the following important questions. Number one, is patient likely to be volume responsive through the assessing of left ventricle global function and stroke volume assessment and IVC variability? Second question, are there any abnormalities present that indicating limiting fluid resuscitation? By assessing again, if the left ventricle is severely depressed with severely depressed contractility, or there is right ventricle dysfunction or failure by assessing again the IVC uh, and the right ventricle dilatation. At the end, we will speak about the lung ultrasound, uh, which is showing the first sign of pulmonary edema and sometimes limiting our strategy of volume resuscitation. We'll start by the first uh, one, which is left ventricle systolic assessment. Actually, we are, as intensivists, we are not going to speak about the uh, complicated way to assess the left ventricle uh, function. We need something uh, simple for intensivists to perform it and to get benefit from. So we'll go to the global visualize, estimating the overall contractility. To answer simple question, is this hard? hyperdynamic or it's normal or it's depressed. And this answer will be very important in identifying the left ventricle contribution to hemodynamic profile and tailoring the resuscitation. Simply from the uh, apical four chamber view, you can get this view of the heart. You can see here that you will put your prop in the apical area roughly just below the nipple, and then you will direct your probe marker towards, uh, toward, towards three o'clock as here uh, by the uh, point, sorry. Okay, and then you will direct your marker towards uh, three o'clock to get the view of four chamber of the heart. As you can see in the right side, this is the normal size, and function of the left ventricle. See how it's contracting. Why in the left side? See the left ventricle when it will get dilated and see the contractility. It's very poor. Plus, if you can notice with me, this shadow moving inside the left ventricle, which is called a spontaneous echo contrast, telling you that the movement of blood in this ventricle is very slow. So this patient, he will be at very high risk of thrombosis and he will need anticoagulation. Plus you can see here some pleural effusion, telling you that this patient really, he is in severe heart failure. So if you are going to a tailor resuscitation plan for those two patients, I think we will elect to go for fluid, more fluid for the patient who is on the right side with good left ventricle function, while in the left side, with this poor contractility of the left ventricle, I think no more fluid will get will give any benefit. I think more inotropes will be needed 
And even so, if I will elect to give some fluid, I will give a small amount, for example, 5 ml per kg over long period of time, like for example, 20 minutes or even 30 minutes. We have to understand and to realize that this way of assessment of the heart, this strategy is uh, uh, it's, uh, subjective and it's operator dependent and it's need at least uh, two quality of view to understand the three dimension uh, uh, movement of the heart. For that, we will, go, we will go to another view assessing the left ventricle function. We will go to something. It's called the short axis barosternal view. As you can see here, the prop in the barosternal area and the marker is directed towards the left shoulder of the patient. Then you will view the heart. You will, you, you will view the left ventricle in its short axis. And as you can see here, you can visualize the left ventricle at the papillary muscle in both two patients. And see here in the right side, this is the left ventricle when it's contracting very well. Why in the left side, see the walls of the left ventricle is not contracting, it's just stroking and the contractility is very poor. The same for that patient. This patient in the right side, if he's hemodynamically not stable, I think he can tolerate more fluid rather than going higher with the inotropes. While the patient on the left side, I think more inotropes will improve the hemodynamic of this patient rather than giving more fluid. Is there any way to assess the uh, cardiac function? The answer is yes, there is many ways, but we will speak about another simple way to uh, measure the cardiac output and to assess the left ventricle function through the transthoracic echocardiography, which will provide, will establish alternative to thermodilution in determining cardiac output. How we will do it? Simply, we know that cardiac output is equal to stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate. Heart rate easily, we can get it from the monitor or from anywhere from the patient, but we are left with the stroke volume how to get benefit of the bedside ultrasound and echo to estimate the stroke volume. You know that the stroke volume is the amount of blood ejected by the left ventricle with each contraction. So when the left ventricle, it will contract, it will push an amount of blood, which is the stroke volume. So if we will be able to measure and estimate this amount of blood going out of the LVOT, going out of the left ventricle through the left ventricle outflow tract, which is the LVOT. If we can estimate that amount, we will be able to estimate the stroke volume. And this amount of blood, it's equal to this cylinder, equal to this column. So if we can estimate the size and the volume of this cylinder, so we can estimate that time, the stroke volume itself. In geometry, it's easy to get the volume of this cylinder if we have two factors. The factor, the first factor is to know the radius of this circle, the base of this cylinder. And we can get this radius from checking the diameter of the LVOT itself or the aortic valve annulus. The second factor I needed to check the volume of this cylinder is the height, the height, this column, the height of this column. So once I will have the radius, and I will have the height, I will be able to check how much the volume of this cylinder, then this is the stroke volume. Okay, we'll start by one by one. So the radius of this cylinder is equal to half of the diameter of the LVOT, while the, while the height of this cylinder is something called VTI, which is velocity time integral. You know from physics that speed, multiplied by time, it will give you distance. So if we have a way to check the speed and time, the flow is going through the LVOT, we will be able to check the distance and there is a way to do that. So again, stroke volume, it will be the circle surface area, this circle surface area, multiply by this height, which is something it's called the VTI. We are going to speak about it in the next slides. So, to calculate the cardiac output, you need three factors, as we mentioned. First, left ventricle outflow tract diameter to get the radius of that circle. 
Number two, you need the LVOT, VTI, which is giving us the height of the cylinder to check its size. And then you need the heart rate of the patient to calculate the cardiac output. We will start by the first factor to get the diameter of the LVOT. What you need? You will go with the echo bra. You will put it in the barasternal area, barasternal area in the second or third left in the, on the left side of the sternum, in the left border of the sternum, in the second or third intercostal space. And then you will direct your marker towards the right shoulder of the patient. Then you will be able to view the heart, to view the left ventricle in its long axis. So this is right ventricle, this is the left ventricle, and this is the LVOT, left ventricle outflow. To check the diameter of the LVOT and then get the radius of that circle, you have to freeze your image at mid-systole when the left ventricle outflow, it's open the maximum, and then that time you will freeze. And then you will start measuring the LVOT just below the cusp of the aortic valve, and then you will measure it. You will have the number direct measurement, it will give you, for example, here it's 0.7 centimeter, and it's giving you the diameter of this circle. From uh, dividing this number by two, you will get the radius, and then you will use it in the formula to calculate the cylinder size. We'll go to the next factor, which is the VTI. To get the VTI, you need to show from five chamber view or three chamber view. Five chamber view means you will visualize the heart. In its five chamber means left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, and this is the outflow here. You will get it from the same apical area by some tilt tilting anteriorly or rotating a little bit to drop to open the LVOT. Opening the LVOT here to get an optimal estimation of the left ventricle outflow and velocity and VTI, you need an angle to between your prop and the LVOT to be less than 20, as much as you can. Then what you will do after getting that image, you will add pulse Doppler just below the uh, aortic valve. You will add the pulse, pulse Doppler marker just here or here, and then you will start imaging as follows. So remember that this is the LVOT and your pulse Doppler is just here. And then you will start imaging. You will have waves going down because the blood is going away from your pop. And then you have two ways. You have two variables here, which are very important in uh, estimation of the cardiac output. And then uh, you get some benefit from that to tailor your resuscitation. Is, it, is this patient is going to get benefit from fluid or inotopes? So you can do a direct measurement, direct me measurement of the height of this wave to have the speed, which is the maximum, maximum velocity of the blood going out of the LVOT, going out of the left ventricle. Here, for example, maximum speed, P max, is 79 uh, centimeter per second. Or you can trace this wave, all the wave, you can trace it to get something it's called the VTI, which is Velocity time integral. This velocity time integral, it will give you the height of the cylinder. You need to check its volume to know the stroke volume. Okay. Now we'll go to our formula. Cardiac output is equal stroke volume multiplied by heart rate. Stroke volume, as we mentioned, the circle surface area, which is by multiplied by radius square, multiplied by the VTI. VTI, which is the height of the cylinder we get it from pulse Doppler from LVOT. So the right radius, it's diameter divided by two VTI, velocity time integral, we spoke about it. We will apply our number, we get it before in calculation of the stroke volume, then the cardiac output. So by equal to 3.14, multiply by the diameter of the LVOT, we get it 0.7 centimeter divided by two square. Multiply by 13.5, which is the VTI. Uh, the uh, formula giving us that the stroke volume is 5 ml. So cardiac output for a given heart rate of 135, it will be 5.2 is uh, stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate, which is 703, for example, ml per minute. You can check 
for any reference to check the cardiac output for your patient. Is it in the normal limit or low? The same for the VTI. There is many references depending on the age of the patient telling you also is the VTI within the normal range or it's slow. The, during the, uh, during the uh, uh, adding the uh, pulse Doppler in the LVOT, in some patient, you will see a variability, variability changing in the size of the VTI, changing in the size of the uh, waves getting from pulse Doppler. So you will have different VTI and different maximum velocity. As you can see, this is small wave, this is high wave. By direct or by tracing, you will have different number. Those, this uh, difference, it will help us also, as we will speak uh, in the next slide, how to change our plan of resuscitation for fluid or for inotropes. Okay, we have something, it's called Delta VTI. We will get it in those patients, they have different, different size of wave and different maximum velocity. Delta VTI, it's equal. The maximum VTI we get it from the biggest wave minus the minimum on over the average VTI, okay? So it will represent the maximum and minimum VTI uh, during 10 cardiac cycle to have the chance to have respiration cycle in this uh, time. How to get benefit from uh, that uh, Delta VTI? There's many studies showed that this Delta VTI, for example, this is one of them. Delta VTI with a cut of 15.9 can predict that the, this patient, he has uh, the chance to get benefits from fluid, more fluid, so he's fluid responsive. And you can see here, Delta VTI with a cut of 15.9, very high sensitive, uh, since, uh, with very high sensitivity and specificity, uh, unlike, which is uh, unlike the other stroke volume variation or uh, pulse pressure variation. So you can depend on this Delta VTI, and there is many studies actually speaking about that. Uh, Delta VTI, it's more than 15.9 for this study, is uh, telling that this patient is responsive for fluid. Also the same for the maximum velocity. Without tracing the wave, the all wave, just direct measurement of that wave. This uh, systemic review and meta-analysis of many studies showed that respiratory variation in the aortic blood flow peak velocity was the only variable shown to predict fluid responsiveness in children. So uh, the peak velocity and fluid responsiveness uh, uh, showed that um, in a different study, a bit to beat variation in the LVOT maximum velocity, more than 12% or bit to beat variation in the maximum LVOT velocity during the, during the respiratory cycle of more than 20% predict fluid responsiveness to volume expansion. We'll speak now, we'll go next to uh, inferior vena cava uh, variability. Uh, we know that in spontaneously breathing patient, the IVC collapses with inspiration as the right atrial pressure falls below atmospheric pressure. But in mechanically ventilated patient, the IVC will distend due to increased intrathoracic pressure. There is many studies showed that in pediatric and adult, there is evidence for if those patients, they are ventilated in, in ventilated pediatric or adult that uh, suggesting respiratory change in the IVC diameter is an accurate predictor of fluid responsiveness, for example, here in septic patient. But, however, there is considerable debate as to whether evaluating the degree of IVC collapse is of value in spontaneously breathing patient. Actually, I could review only two studies have shown that IVC collapse uh, reliably predict fluid responsiveness in spontaneous deep breathing patient. Even the numbers from those two studies are too much different from each other. For example, here, the, uh, the vena cava collapsibility index of more than 15 can predict that this patient is, uh, can predict this patient that he is 
fluid responsive, while in the other study done in 2012 showed that in spontaneously breathing patients with acute circulatory failure, high IVC collapsibility values, more than 40% are usually associate, associated with fluid responsiveness, while low values less than 40% do not exclude fluid responsiveness. How to apply this, uh, how to, to get the IVC first, and then how to check the variability during inspiration. To get the IVC and to check its diameter during inspiration and expiration, you need to go to the subcostal area with your prop, echo prop, and then you will direct the marker towards 12 o'clock or the head of the patient, and then you will tilt your prop a little bit up until you will get the connection between the IVC and the right atrium. Here, the IVC. So what you will do, you will add a mode just below the hepatic vein. This is the hepatic vein and this is the IVC. Just below the hepatic vein, you will add a mode. You will have this view. What you need to do, you will need to wait until the patient, he will have breathe or the ventilator will give the patient breathe. Then you will freeze the screen and you will start your measurement of the IVC diameter as in the following, for example, here, this is the IVC, how it was uh, shown in the uh, M mode. This is the IVC during expiration. This is ventilated patient. And this is the IVC during inspiration. So the delta IVC is equal to uh, the diameter of the IVC during inspiration minus expiration over inspiration. In ventilated patient, if this change, it's more than 18% or let's say one fifth of the diameter that predict uh, fluid responsiveness. To get it easier, uh, simply if you have a patient, uh, you started to visualize the IVC and then you found that the IVC of the patient is totally collapsing during respiration. I think I will elect to give this patient more fluid because most probably he will respond to while if I have a patient with a dilated IVC like this, it's almost not moving and not changing its diameter during respiration, most probably this patient is volume overloaded and he will not get benefit from extra fluid I will give. But in conditions that there will be for this dilated IVC, no right ventricle diastolic dysfunction, no pulmonary valve stenosis, no tricuspid valve regurge or stenosis, no arrhythmia, and no obstructive shock. Like, for example, patient with cardiac tamponade or patient he has RV, diastolic dysfunction, pulmonary valve stenosis, like patient with tetralogy of fallow. So the IVC will be dilated, but the patient, he will get benefit from fluid. On the other side, if I have patient like uh, this patient, he's collapsing his IVC totally during respiration, I think he, this patient, he will get benefit from more fluid to get more hemodynamic stable. So we will speak about flat or fat IVC in the absence of this pathologies. Next, we'll go to the pulmonary assessment of uh, for fluid uh, resuscitation. Uh, Lichtenstein, uh, full, he uh, estimated a good protocol, which is a false protocol, using the lung ultrasound studies have been proposed to determine adequate fluid resuscitation after echocardiography to evaluate the patient for causes of obstructive shock. We have two examples about two patients. The first patient on the right side, as you can see here, this is the normal lung. This is the ribs here, this one and this one, and this is the shadow of the ribs. Here, the sliding movement of the pleura, as you can see, and what you can see from the lung tissue is the only artifact, this one and this one. And here, which is artifact, it's called A-line, telling you that this lung is dry with the presence of just few and some B waves. You can see here accidentally by imaging and viewing this lung ultrasound, I can tell that the A-line redominance throughout the whole lung, which is suggesting fluid tolerance. So this patient, he can tolerate more fluid. Or if I am giving fluid, I will ask for more fluid because he, is asked, he can tolerate more. While on the left side, 
as you can see here, the same ribs shadow, but here there is a black shadow between the two layers of the pleura. This black shadow is a pleural effusion. And as you can see here, there is no more A line, but there is a lot of B line and it's diffused gathering together to give you almost white lung. So this lung is very wet. And if I am giving fluid resuscitation, I have to stop. If I am, uh, and I have to go for uh, more inotropes, for example. Okay. Uh, another example, if you have uh, this patient with this chest X-ray, I think nobody, we will elect to give extra fluid for this patient to maintain his hemodynamics. But waiting for the X-ray technician to come and the X-ray to be done, or you are giving fluid, and then you need to check what is the result of fluid I, I give it. Your patient still, is still hemodynamically not stable. I can easily do echo and I can repeat it whenever I like. And this is actually the real patient we are speaking about with this chest X-ray. This is the apical part of the lung, how it uh, could be seen by ultrasound. The same for the basal part of the lung, how it, uh, it's looking like very wet with pleural effusion. So the decision uh, not to give a fluid, uh, it will be made before the X-ray, it will come without wasting any time. Uh, another patient with this almost uh, normal uh, chest X-ray, uh, you are uh, thinking about giving more fluid. Can my patient tolerate more fluid? Uh, and you don't want to wait for the X-ray and uh, to come, the technician is busy somewhere. You can also perform lung ultrasound to check and see how your lung here is dry, see the A-lines, see there is no lung tissue seen here. There is almost no B-line. The same in the basal part of the lungs, uh, the same view of the upper part also, only A-lines showing dry lung and telling you that your patient is fluid tolerance uh, rather than uh, being uh, fluid over. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hayan. Uh, Excellent uh, presentation, very clear, uh, highly appreciated. We'll leave the questions until uh, we finish from the uh, next speaker. The next speaker is Dr. Sam. Uh, we have patients that we extubate and uh, they fail. And uh, we, we don't know why they are failing. And nowadays, with the help of the point of care ultrasound, we have many clues from utilizing the ultrasound that will tell us why the patient is fed. And, um, and this is uh, getting uh, uh, more and more helpful in the approach for patients who are failing uh, extubation. Dr. Hussam is uh, associate consultant in our pediatric cardiac ICU. Uh, he, is, he graduated from the University of uh, uh, Al Baas uh, in 2006. He had master degree in pediatrics, uh, 2010 from the Damascus University. He had Arab board uh, in pediatrics in 2011. Uh, he's been associate consultant with us for the last almost uh, uh, almost 10 years. Uh, Dr. Hassam is very active in ultrasound and he has many publications. Uh, Dr. Hassam, please go ahead. Bismillah uh, rahim thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, the voice and images are clear? Clear. Huh? Okay, uh, I am going to speak briefly about point of care ultrasound for failed extubation in pediatric cardiac ICU. Uh, we have to mix uh, between the theory and the practice. So we'll go from theory to practice and then we will go back from practice to theory. Uh, when we go to the ultrasound machine, the first question will come to our mind, which probe should I use? In general, try to mix uh, the probes use the linear probe and microconvex probe for diagnostic uh, uh, issues, use the cardio sector uh, probe for uh, cardiac related uh, problems, and use the linear probe for ultrasound guided procedure for central line insertion or big tail uh, insertion. Then uh, the next question will come to your mind when you, you go with the ultrasound machine to the patient where I should put my probe. Uh, as general pediatric uh, ICU intensivist, you, uh, you will put uh, your probe in this area, one, uh, one two, three, four, uh, to, uh, uh, in general. But for our cardiac patients, we added uh, four, uh, uh, four areas. 
in the neck to check focal cord uh, dysfunction. Uh, subcostal view uh, here uh, to check both diaphragm and to take a quick look at the heart. We check also the abdomen to check the ascites and the viability of the intestines. Also, we, we, we also we check uh, the four chambers the view for, for a quickly look at the heart. Uh, the most important when you do the, when you are going to do ultrasound, don't do single uh, single fast view. Try to do multiple views because this will increase your sensitivity and specificity to almost hundred percent. So in general, you will put your marker uh, toward uh, head of the patient toward twelve o'clock, and you will go up and down. Then you will put your marker toward uh, the nine o'clock, uh, and you will try to go right and left. And so you will get multiple views and you will increase your sensitivity and specificity. We, try, we published the uh, algorithm here to, uh, to help the intensivist to, to detect the problem. So what I am looking for, I have, uh, for example, patient with abdominal distension, post cardiac surgery, it is affecting his hemodynamics. It is affecting his respiratory. So do quickly ultrasound to check there is ascites. I have spider post cardiac surgery like post coarctation. And uh, so do quickly vocal cord ultrasound to check uh, vocal cord dysfunction. Uh, I had sudden hemodynamic instability. Uh, do echo to check if there is pericardial effusion. Then we will move to the diaphragm ultrasound and the lung ultrasound. In the lung ultrasound, you will answer four questions. Is there a broader effusion? Is there is a lung pathology consolidation slash uh, collapse? Is there a pneumothorax? And is there pulmonary congestion? If you have pulmonary congestion related with your echo information to, uh, to get conclusions that I, I am dealing with non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema or cardiogenic pulmonary edema. This is uh, some of our uh, publications in uh, pediatric cardiac ICU with the uh, rest of our teams. So we'll start with the uh, first uh, part, uh, vocal cord ultrasound, especially after arch uh, repair and, uh, and, uh, and BDA closure. So what you are, go you are going to put your probe in the neck, the marker will be toward uh, nine o'clock. So this is the right uh, observation, this is the left observation. And you will you look at this uh, two thin, uh, bright uh, echogenic uh, lines here. This is the vocal cords, uh, and you will see the movement. In this view, it's very clear that the both vocal cords are moving nicely around the vocal cords. Uh, around the vocal cords, here you will see the vocal cord muscle. Then you will see the, uh, the thyroid uh, structures here, and here you will see the arteinoid cartilage, both uh, white dots here. It's uh, in this image also. Uh, if we compare this patient uh, here, the, this is the vocal cords, uh, they are moving very nicely. Uh, while in this patient, post truncus arteriosis uh, surgery, this is the right uh, vocal cord, this is the left vocal cord. The left vocal cord, very clear, is uh, paralyzed. Here, another patient, you can see clearly that the, ra the right vocal cord is moving nicely, the left is um, not moving. Sam, if you can uh, use your point, please. It's clear now, Dr. Jose. If you can use the pointer to, uh, yani, to, to tell what you are talking about. Oh, you. Okay. you cannot see yeah. the pointer? Yeah, I can. Yeah. You, you can, uh, Dr. Sam, you can go to the uh, uh, anonate uh, from above option. Then after that, you can use the pointer. It will be clear for us. Okay, I will try to use it. We can share it again, then on the other screen, underneath. That will be shown after the sharing the, yeah, slide, exactly. You can see now the floor? Yes, but so we cannot see the marker yet. So, okay. uh, yes, up, you can see uh, uh, on the view option, you can, uh, you can press on enemies, and after that, you can use the marker. Um, can you try again? Okay. In the Zoom. Now, I think this uh, Omar, so please will be. Uh, now we can see. Uh, we still we cannot we could not see the marker. You allow me, Doctor Hassan. Just press Control L. The okay. marker will be laser pointer. Control L. 
Control L when okay. you during a presentation mode. Okay. In the presentation mode. Huh? Okay. Yes. Now. You I can see my. Uh... Can see your presentation. Just if Control I... L, then okay. it will be a laser pointer. Control L. You can see now. Uh, can you move move the pointer a little? لا موف كانك بتحرك الارو الماوس يعني يس يس يو كان سي ناو دكتور نو لك وي كان سي يو كان سي نو نو يعني او في كان كان اتس اوكي اوكي جست اي ويل تراي لاست تراي Uh, sorry, well, uh, you cannot see, sir. No, not yet. We cannot see it. Okay, I, I will continue because uh, technical issue. Uh, so uh, the vocal cords are moving uh, here. Uh, in the in the other uh, ultrasound uh, here, the the left vocal cord is not moving. Uh, we uh, we performed the study with Dr. Shas and the rest of the colleague, and we found that the sensitivity and specificity for ultrasound is very high uh, if you uh, use it. Then we will go to other dilemma. You have multiple X-ray with patients with diaphragm dysfunction. So always postcardiac surgery is a thing to use uh, diaphragm ultrasound for the patients who had difficulties in weaning from positive pressure ventilation or they need reopening uh, uh, or need for intubation within 24 hours after trial of extubation, or they have abnormal elevation of their from with no explanation. So if you look at the second image here, uh, the right diaphragm is striking up high. So no doubt you are going to request for uh, diaphragm, ultra, for diaphragm uh, ultrasound. But the rest of the patients, especially the patients who are on positive pressure ventilation, it's difficult to, do, to tell from the X-ray that, okay, we have diaphragm dysfunction. So we published also a study uh, about diaphragm ultrasound, and we found the highest incidence of diaphragm glycation for the patient who had arterial switch operation, uh, along with the uh, aortic arch repair. All the patients who had underwent to diaphragm glycation were under four months uh, of age, and, uh, and we performed the glycation after uh, two weeks, and this is uh, the di cardiac diagnosis and cardiac surgery for uh, for multiple patients. Uh, so the question now, where I will put uh, my uh, probe? I will put uh, my probe initially in the subdivoid window. The marker will be toward uh, nine o'clock. So the liver on the right of the screen, uh, the, 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 the stomach uh, shadow on the left of the screen, the right diaphragm is uh, moving uh, toward uh, the abdomen in the right uh, side. So it's moving in the correct direction while the left diaphragm is very clear, it's paradoxical. Uh, so the patient, this patient had left diaphragm uh, paradoxical paralysis after cardiac surgery due to phrenic nerve injury. If you go to the next, uh, to the right video, you can see clearly the right diaphragm is moving nicely towards the abdomen while the left diaphragm is moving, uh, is not moving, it's paralyzed, it's fixed, uh, it's a flat. So another example, uh, if you have a dressing in the subdivoid area, difficult for you to, uh, to, uh, to perform comparative images, you go to the lateral views uh, in the mid-axillary line around the eight uh, intercostal space, you will put your marker toward the uh, pointer toward uh, the head of the patient, uh, you, this is the diaphragm in the, in, the, uh, in the loops. You can see the liver, you can see the diaphragm. The diaphragm is not moving. So the patient had the uh, right diaphragm dysfunction very clear. While if you compare the left, uh, the left uh, diaphragm, the spleen shadow, this is the diaphragm and the, the lungs of the patient, it's very clear that the patient uh, had uh, uh, normal left uh, diaphragm. If we perform the, you cannot see the doctor the the marker. Oh, still. One minute, I will try to see like this. You can see now. No, still what we don't. And then now we yeah yes go ahead. We go can back. see it. We can oh, see it again. Oh, okay. we can see it. No, okay. we can see it. Okay, so we put uh, the marker here uh, toward the head of the patient here in the lateral uh, uh, 
uh, in the mid axillary line around eight intercostal space. So this is a, the this is the liver of the patient. This is the diaphragm, and this is the lungs. Here is the legs of the patient. Here is the head of the patient. It's very clear the right diaphragm is not moving. Why the left diaphragm of that patient, the same patient? See, see how it's strong. This is the spleen of the patient. This is the lungs of the patient. This is the uh, this is the diaphragm. The diaphragm is compensating. The weakness of the right diaphragm is moving very nicely. If we put a mode screening on that diaphragm here, see this is here is uh, the abdomen level and this is the lungs level and between there is the diaphragm. So here this is the diaphragm. This is the liver or the of the or the spleen and this is the lungs. In inspiration, very clear the diaphragm excursion is up is normal. It's more than 0.4 uh, centimeter, uh, is more than 0.4 centimeter. Uh, so in the patient who are less than four months age, this is the cut limit for us, more than 0.4 centimeter. So this is normal. We'll go to the next. While here, see, this is the left, uh, this is a spleen. This is a stomach uh, bubble. This is a diaphragm here. So this is the head of the patient here. This is the legs of the patient. It's very clear the diaphragm is not moving when you put the M mode. It's very clear the diaphragm is flat. Uh, so again, uh, here, this is uh, the, the, the spleen or liver. This is the lung. This is the diaphragm. This is the spine. Here, this is the abdomen level with the spleen level. Here is the lung level. And this is the excursion of the diaphragm, very clear. It's moving inside the abdomen in, uh, in inspiration. This is a normal more than 0.4 centimeter. Here, the diaphragm is very weak, 0.2 centimeter. Here, the diaphragm is flat. While here in inspiration, here the diaphragm is paradoxical, here in the inspiration. When you do diaphragm ultrasound or when you do vocal cord ultrasound, the patient should be uh, disconnected from positive pressure ventilation. The, should be, the patient should, uh, uh, should uh, be left uh, in a spontaneous breathing. So we categorized our uh, diaphragm uh, this func uh, function as normal or paresis or paralysis, uh, either absent motion or paradoxical motion. Then we would algorithm for the from uh, dysfunction post cardiac surgery. As conclusion, for the patient who are less than four months, uh, after two weeks uh, of trial of optimizing medical therapy, if you fail, refer them for glycation and refer earlier for the patient who had single centricate. Now, if you have sudden instability for the patients uh, who uh, in form of respiratory distress or hypoxia, all of a sudden, you go as intensive intensivist with uh, pulse guidelines. So you will think about DOBI, uh, displacement, obstruction, pneumothorax, and equipment. Okay, clinically you suspect the pneumothorax. Uh, the technician in the ER cannot uh, join you to do an uh, X ray. The patient is very sick. So what you will do? You will do ultrasound. Uh, what you are going to look in the ultrasound? You will imagine yourself in the beach or in the sea, and you are going to to, to imagine yourself as if you are uh, coming from the sea here, far far away to reach the pleura here. Then you will you will see the shore. This is the normal situation. So look here, what do we have here? We have here normal pattern of ultrasound and here abnormal pattern of ultrasound. In the normal pattern of ultrasound, you can see pleural sliding. When the pleural sliding, you will see some V lines here like this. The silent uh, pleura, what, we have, what you will have, see, you will see uh, the, pleura is the, the pleura line is not moving and you will see the A lines here and the A lines equidistant. See, you will see the A lines. So this is here the area of uh, uh, pneumothorax, and here is the area of uh, normal lung. So what we have seen here, we have seen the lung point. It is a connection between the normal pleura and abnormal pleura. You are 100% sure that this is pneumothorax. There is no doubt. Now, so now you will go and ask the question where I can see the lung point. That depends on the pneumothorax, how it is significant. But in general, the more significant, uh, uh, the more significant pneumothorax, you will see your lung point posteriorly and lateral. For example, here is the liver of the patient. And here, everywhere, you will see this is plural lines and A line, A line, A line, A line. Plural is not sliding. There is no B line. There is A line. This is no mosaic. There is small part here moving only. This is the normal pleural only because this patient had tension pneumothorax. So here, this is the lung point. Here, we are sure that 100% this is pneumothorax. You want more information? Okay, you can put M mode. What you will do, you will put M mode on the normal lung. When you will put M mode in the normal lung, so you are coming from the sea here. Then you reach uh, the beach here, the pleural line. 
So this is the sea level, and this is the pleura, and here's supposed to be the uh, shore. If you come from the sea and you found the pleural line is sliding like this, so the pattern of ultrasound will be changed. So this is the sea because it is motionless layer. Then you will have pleura. Then because of sliding of pleura, you will have a change in the artifact and you will have the shore pattern like this. So here, this is the skin and muscle. This is the pleura and this is the shore. But if you put your M mode in the silent lung, in the area of uh, pneumothorax, what you will see, I am uh, ultrasound beam. I will go through the skin, then I will find the pleural is not uh, sliding, so she's not interesting. So I will continue the same. So what will happen? I will have the sea level above the pleura. Then there is uh, no change in the artifact. So I will have again the sea below. So sea below, sea above, and sea below, and then in pleura. There is a very important point here that to put your pleural line in the middle of screen, because sometimes they uh, they increase the scale. So you will find the pleural line here, then you will see, okay, there is no change in the, uh, in the ultrasound, uh, in the ultrasound pattern. Uh, we'll go here, this is the same. Uh, now, this is to explain more about uh, the lung point. For example, if you do ultrasound here, uh, you put your probe here, you will not see lung point because this is the area of, uh, of uh, pneumothorax. But if you put it in the connection between the normal lung and pneumothorax, very clear, this is the, uh, normal lung and here the silent lung. So this is here, see here, it is the lung bone and you are 100% that's pneumothorax and you can put your needle easily at the side of the pneumothorax. Uh, see here, another view, you can see easily here that this is the lung point here. This is the normal lung while this is the silent lung with A line, A line, A line, A line. Now, now, Sorry, we'll go to the next video. If you go, this, we have this patient two months old with difficulty to win from NIV. If you go, uh, if you read this X-ray, you will not be convinced at all to put, uh, put, to put big tail for this patient. After we put big tail, okay, the X-ray, the left lung is more uh, dry uh, to co uh, compared to the left lung here. And the costophrenic uh, uh, angel here is more, more uh, clear. So why why we go ahead and put uh, and put uh, big tail because this is a, a, a spleen or liver regardless this is a diaphragm this is a collapsed lung and this is here fluid collection so we go uh, safely through with the needle here we insert it and we get the 20 ml per kg within one hour from this patient and we were able to wean him after we inserted uh, the drain very clear the pleura is touching the origin of the diaphragm here the origin of the diaphragm muscle here this is the liver or the spleen regardless you can see sliding and you can see b line so alhamdulillah you don't have no thorax so you are safe uh, other patient here this is the spleen this is the diaphragm this is the pleural effusion and this is the collapsed lung here uh, when to say that it is significant uh, fusion, that depends uh, on clinical situation and you have some hints from ultrasound. The more the fluid pushed your uh, lungs away from the diaphragm, it is more safe to go and perform uh, synthesis. In general, but there is nothing proof that if you have distance of two, more than two to three centimeter for the patient who have low, very low weight, uh, like in unit or infant, you are safe. If you have distance between the between the muscles and lung more than two three centimeters, uh, you are also safe uh, to do uh, uh, synthesis. Here, see, this is a spleen. Here, this is a diaphragm. This is a collapsed lung. This is pleural effusion. If you have pleural effusion or you have significant lung pathology, you will be able to see the thoracic spine, and this, this is what we call spine sign. Here, the more you so uh, more uh, vertebra, it means that you have more lung pathology or you have more pleural effusion. This is indirect sign how it is significant, the pleural effusion. See here in the bottom here, very clear that you can see the thoracic spine. This is abnormal. Uh, in general, you don't see the thoracic spine unless you have significant pleural effusion or significant uh, lung pathology. So here, this is the abdominal spine. This is the thoracic spine. Here, you, can, you don't see the collapsed lung because you have significant pleural effusion here. Uh, again, you can see the pleural effusion, the thoracic spine. Now, don't be confused always. Do multiple views, go up and down with your probe, go, go, go right and left and answer the question, where is the fluid? Simply here, see, this is a spleen, this is a diaphragm, this is the lung level. Okay, so where is the fluid? It's not clear. Do another views here. 
uh, here is a fluid. Uh, I can see some fluids here, but uh, my dear, this fluid here is behind, be, below the diaphragm. You are in the abdomen. This is ascites. This is not pleural effusion. The, be careful, please. While if you look here, this is a spleen. Uh, this is the diaphragm. This is the abdominal spine. You can start to see the cirrhotic spine. You start to see some pleural effusion and some collapsed lung. So don't be confused. Do always multiple views. Sometimes you have white X-ray. You don't know what's running. You do ultrasound. You see the lungs uh, with the regular margin like this lung. It's a simple collapse. You need some physiotherapy and you have some fluid uh, pleural effusion, but it's not significant. Uh, while if you do ultrasound for this patient, you can see the spleen here. This is the diaphragm here. And you have dense collapse here, hepatized lung and white dot area. This is air, air bronchogram because this patient had consolidation. Uh, whenever you will do lung ultrasound, you, you should look for pleural line. You should go for B lines and you should go for A lines. This is a pleural line here. This is a P lines. This is a vertical. And you, the A lines is uh, the uh, and A lines is horizontal. In general, if you have more B lines, you have more width long. If you have more uh, A lines, uh, A lines from A air, you have more air, so more dry lungs. Then you go to the pleural line and assess it. It is thin or thick. If you it is thin with uh, a lot of uh, with a lot of uh, uh, B lines like this patient, it's very clear that he had congested lungs, muscle, and in presence of cardiac lesion, this is cardiogenic pulmonary uh, edema uh, here. But uh, if you uh, here also look, uh, you have uh, collescent uh, B lines, it is pulmonary edema, and uh, you cannot see sparse B lines, it's uh, collescent, uh, collescent here. So uh, always look at the plural lines, P lines, A lines, and uh, try to, uh, to answer. It is a bilateral change. It's unilateral. It's localized. How is the plural line? Is there any consolidation be below the plural lines? Uh, always try to answer this question. So again here, this is a normal pattern. Uh, this is a rib shadow. This is a rib shadow. This is a plural in between. This is, there is only one uh, B line here. While this patient, he had one, two, three, four. Uh, B lines. In general, when you have more to three uh, B lines, you are going towards the weight lung. Here, look at the sub pleura. The pleura is thin, is thick here, and there is sub pleural uh, consolidation. So uh, always try to correlate with the clinical picture. For example, in the patient who had uh, tachypnea of a newborn, you will appreciate uh, what we call the double lung point. So as per west zone here, uh, in general, the apex more dry, uh, the pace of the lung is more wet. Uh, this is what we will find in the TTN. So here is a connection between upper and base. Here is a normal pattern, the dry lung, while here it's very wet lung. If you do ultrasound uh, sequence uh, studies, you will find all will be normal after 48 hours. Here, look uh, at this patient. He had uh, a lot of air, uh, air, uh, air bronchogram and consolidation uh, in this area. Uh, when you find the air bronchogram, try to look is there any uh, straight sign or irregular uh, lung uh, margin that will cause, uh, will cause with pneumonia like this patient, see here, or, uh, or, or this patient, this is the normal here, a lot of uh, wet lungs here, but here started to see abnormal pleura, subpleural consolidation, this is abnormal, or try to see, uh, to answer uh, the question, is my fluid loculated, septated, or it's a, flu uh, or it's, uh, or it's a free fluid collection. Uh, see, this is one of our patients uh, who had simple cardiac surgery coarctation. Uh, all of a sudden, the patient become febrile. He had pulmonary hemorrhage. We did a three x-rays within one hour. You can see the right ch the, uh, the changes very clear in the right lung here within one hour. So we did echo. The heart is not bad cannot explain what's running. So what we have seen here is the lung, con lung collapse in this area. And if you look, I li uh, look here, this here, if you can see my marker here, you can see the white, white, uh, like white uh, letter, Y, Y, Y letter here, one, two, three, three bar, like this one here, Y. So this we call what we call it dynamic air bronchogram, dynamic air bronchogram. If you see the bronchogram is moving, is the branching, it means it's going more with pneumonia. So this is what we call it dynamic air, program, air bronchogram. If you collect it with other signs like uh, shred sign, irregular pleural, uh, septated pleural effusion, this is called with uh, pneumonia. 
here very clear uh, if you look here for this video you can appreciate that this patient uh, had the uh, dynamic uh, dynamic air bronchogram look here see the air see how uh, the y shape we saw, we saw it before or uh, or the lines here is is branching is going up and down up and down up and down like 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 this so this is very clear that this is pneumonia this is pathognomic here for uh, pneumonia patient uh, put in your mind not everything black is a fluid for example this is uh, this is a uh, liver shadow here and this is a uh, ivc don't be confused oh i have the abdominal collection put color of flow always and check uh, that this is a fluid uh, simple fluid or this is blood in the vessels uh, we we are using ultrasound in our uh, bcicu to check the response for the treatment for example this patient had mitral rigor she was in severe heart failure we admitted him we put him on uh, on positive pressure ventilation we started the uh, inotropes and we started the uh, diuresis and we did for him uh, eco uh, eco series so see here the blura to start with the blura lines the blura is thin so this is uh, this is the uh, first point the second point you have a lot of b lines with the treatment see in general uh, uh, here you have a lot of B lines. You give him more support. The B lines is less. Here a lot of B lines, a lot of B lines. Then the B lines started to be less. Then the B lines started to be less. It means that okay, we are in the right direction. You are giving the patient appropriate treatment. When we did echo for him, also quick screening, we find uh, very clear that the patient had uh, also uh, pericardial uh, effusion. We are using ultrasound for following the response for our treatment and our uh, decision. So here also the pericardial effusion for uh, the previous patient is very, very clear. And you can see also the lung is congested from this video. Uh, when you have patient with hemodynamic instability, all of a sudden, even they did echo in the morning and they said you the echo is okay, always, always do a quick view and answer the question. Uh, there is pericardial effusion or no pericardial effusion. Is the function compromised or the function is not compromised? This is uh, this is essential question for any intensivist to answer it. So here very clear there is a pericardial effusion. Here there is very clear there is no pericardial effusion. Uh, sometimes the, the respiratory compromise and hemodynamic compromise coming from the abdomen, especially for the patient who had uh, abdominal distension. So, uh, for example, this patient had uh, right ventricular restrictive physiology. He accumulated a, a lot of fluids. Uh, he, he had abdominal distension. Uh, he was hemodynamically compromised, respiratory compromised, and we are not able uh, to, uh, to improve him with the conservative medical management. So what we did here, this is the uh, abdomen, uh, this is a uh, surface, this is a uh, muscle and skin. And this is here our needle. This is the intestine. You look at the intestine here. You inserted your needle here, then you proceed with the wire. Uh, you are safe, you get fluid, you set it for analysis. Always, 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 always try to uh, get videos for your procedure. Uh, it, it's good for the, to build up the skills and it is more safe for you uh, in the future if any complication happens. Uh, so always uh, try to ask yourself, uh, my lungs is wet or dry, I have uh, unilateral or bilateral changes, I have localized and generalized uh, generalized edema. And at the end of uh, this uh, session, uh, I would like to, uh, to thank everybody. I would like to thank Dr. Hijazi and the rest of the consultant because they are encouraging the ultrasounds. They are always uh, fighting to have new machines. They are always pushing us to go through ultrasound courses uh, to, uh, to learn and to teach the others for knowledge uh, exchange. And this is the way I think we are building our uh, experience. And thank you very much. Jazakumullah khair.